God on Sunday morning. Amen. What a wonderful week we have in the presence of the Lord and in this place. Just a, a quick uh, a little bit of housekeeping for you from New Destiny. They're going to be heading back this morning. I know that several have already had to go back home. Uh, but what Sister Chandra is going to do, if you'll go downstairs before you leave, uh, she's going to hand out black trash bags. And if you've got linens, towels, or wash rags, put them in those trash bags and put them outside your door. Because after service, several of us are going to be going around and gathering them up. We're going to take them and wash them and bring them back so that we don't have to leave that load with the saints of God here. And so make sure, all right, you get a black trash bag, you take, get your linens, your towels, your wash rags. And put them in it, put them outside your door, and then we will go and take care of business, all right? So it's, it's man, what a week. What a week. Amen. What a week. Amen. So glad to have this wonderful couple back here this morning. God bless you. God bless you. I remember Claus and, and your name, I'm sorry, ma'am. Cindy, Cindy and Claus, and he said it's not the one that goes down the chimney, so, <laughs> but I'm glad to have him, amen, and have this couple here with us this morning, and I am just looking forward to what God is going to do today, so can we just, can we just stand our feet if you're able and just welcome the presence of the Lord into this place and then just worship God with all of our hearts. Father, we thank you so much for the honor and the opportunity we have to be here this morning. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. For Lord, we know it is with loving kindness that you draw us into the wells of salvation. Now we pray in the name of Jesus that you would have your way in this place. God, move, Lord God, according to your good pleasure. For Lord, we do understand that you being the head of all things concerning your church, that this is your house. So we pray that the will of God will be done in our midst as it is in the heavens. God, save somebody, strengthen somebody, heal somebody, encourage somebody, challenge somebody, change somebody, God. In this place this morning before we leave, God, we thank you for all you've done this week. We thank you for how you move, God. We thank you for the life of God we feel in this place. Now we pray, God, that you would allow, Lord, this to just be the cherry on top of the dessert, God. Let this last service, God, of this week, God, let it be something special for us to remember, God. Oh, we thank you. We pray for all those that are on the road, God, right now, traveling back to Tennessee, that you would keep them, watch over them, go before them, God. We pray for those who will be leaving today, God, that you'll go with them, God, that you'll grant them God's speed, Lord, and let angels have charge over them, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bless us here this morning as we bless your wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's worship, saints.
trials come on every hand. Amen. God is going to be with us and help us. Thank God for the covering of his presence and the covering of his anointing this morning that we already feel. Uh, I love that first song they sing. Amen. I'm so blessed, so blessed. Got this heartbeat in my chest. Amen. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. Again, so thankful for all those who have come out this morning. And, and we thank God most assuredly that his presence has been with us on this morning. And uh, again, I, I thank God for all of those who are here at Fellowship of Praise, uh, who have been so kind and so cordial, who have been so uh, helpful, uh, those who have jumped in and helped, and those who have served and worked, uh, both here and from the Church of New Destiny. We thank God for them. Thank God that I've got a church that's willing to travel eight and a half, nine hours, and some of y'all drive so slow it was 13 and 14 hours. Amen. You need to, you need to get that anointing of Jehu on you. Amen. The Bible said Jehu drove his chariot furiously. <laughs> But we thank God. My heart is just overwhelmed with gratitude. And uh, this morning, I, I had come with something prepared, but the Lord just changed my mind and while we were <laughs> while we were worshiping here just a moment ago. And it's a very it's a very familiar story. Uh, we all know it, but I, I want to read this out of First Samuel the thirtieth chapter and starting at the first verse the Lord just really just put this on my heart just really just made a minute ago uh, but how many of y'all know we've got to be led of the spirit Amen. and sometimes God's got, to, God's got to be able to change what we think should happen in midstream and just speak to the people because right. this is his church by the way the Bible said here in 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, the first verse, it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day. The, the Malachites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and, it, and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his own sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring hither the ephod. And, I, and Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. And I want to talk about that. Without fail, recover all. Oftentimes in life, and I think if you've lived long enough at all, it doesn't take very long. It can be in your childhood, it can be in your adolescence, it can be in your teenage years, it can be in your early adult years, middle age years, even up into your older age. But there are times that the enemy comes in and he steals from us. Uh, David was off doing uh, the bidding of the Lord. And while he was doing the bidding of the Lord, the enemy came in. And I want to deal with these Amalekites first. Because if Saul had obeyed the Lord in the first place, David would never have had to deal with the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a thorn in the side of Israel. They were a pest. They were a nuisance. They were persecutors and oppressors of Israel. And God told Saul, he said, you go in and you take all of them out. Don't you leave nothing left living. 
But Saul thought he had a better plan than God had. And so he left the choicest of things alive. As if somehow that was a sacrifice and an offering unto the Lord. And God sent Samuel to deal with Saul. And Samuel said, Saul, I thought the Lord told you to destroy all of them. Every living creature of the Amalekites. Their animals, their children, all of them. And Saul said, oh, I did. He said, then what is this bleeding of the sheep that I hear in my ears? He said, was it not better for you to obey than to sacrifice? Right. And to hearken than the fat of rams? Was it better for you to just do what you were told than to think that somehow, even in disobedience, you giving me some wonderful offering, I would receive it anyhow? And because Saul disobeyed the Lord and did not destroy the Amalekites, who came into Ziklag and took David's family? Mm -hmm. Who came into Ziklag and took his children? Who came into Ziklag and took the wives and the children of his men? And the spoils that were there. It was the very people that Saul should have destroyed. And saints of God, I want you to understand there are some enemies in our life that must be destroyed before they touch our children and our grandchildren. Amen. There are some generational curses, if you will. I call them patterns of behavior, learned behaviors. There are some generational curses that we hold on to in our lives that we refuse to try to fight and defeat. But I promise you, whatever you will not defeat in your lifetime, your children will live to fight. And we have to decide whether we're gonna let our children fight our demons or let them go on and fight their own. God wants us to deal with some things in our lives. There are some issues and struggles and circumstances that should not be passed down generationally. If you wanna pass anything down generationally, let it be a generational blessing. If you remember, David was a man after God's own heart, and the Lord declared. Right. And God told them in the law, he said, do not go take wives of the heathens. For when you do it, they will turn your heart from serving the living God. And when Solomon took the throne from David, one of the first things that he did was he went down to Egypt. He signed a peace treaty with Pharaoh, and he married Pharaoh's daughter. He immediately walked into disobedience against the Lord. And now years later, a thousand wives and concubines, he's up in the high places building altars to the gods of his heathen wives. And the Lord came to Solomon and he said, that's it, I'm cutting you out. I'm cutting your seed forever off the throne of Israel. But I'm so thankful that David's grandson had a grandfather whose heart was after God. Amen. Because even though Solomon rebelled against the Lord, and we have no real record of Solomon ever repenting or turning back to the Lord. But God told Solomon, he said, I will not take all of the throne from you, but I will give the throne of Judah unto your son. Why? Because your father, David's heart, was perfect toward me. And I'm going to tell you, children of God, we have a tremendous responsibility to begin to pass down generational blessings unto our children and our grandchildren. In fact, the Bible said that a wise man will pass down blessings even to the third and the fourth generation of his seed. Right. It is time for us to bring ourselves to the place of courage and confidence in God where we say this issue stops at my doorstep. Right. It will not follow my children to theirs. Amen. This problem stops at my doorstep and it will not follow my grandchildren to theirs. Amen. I am bringing an end to it right now. Whether it be generational addiction, generational bitterness, generational poverty, generational divorce, generational immorality, it comes to an end at my doorstep because I refuse to have my children fight something that I was too cowardly to face for myself. It is time for us to begin to pass the blessing unto our children. And I want you to understand finances are not necessarily a blessing. If you pass millions of dollars to your children but your drinking problem 
Right. They will take your millions of dollars and they will drink it up. Right. If you take, if you pass down a generational addiction to your children, it doesn't matter how much money follows it. They will take the inheritance and they will use it to curse themselves. So don't always think that money is blessing. Blessing is passing on to them the name of the Lord. Blessing is passing on to them a faithful father, a faithful grandfather. Blessing is passing on to them a faithful mother and a faithful grandmother. My God, let us start passing down the knowledge of the Lord unto our children. Stop passing down the knowledge of your issues and the knowledge of your abuse and the knowledge of your bitterness. Let us begin to open up our hearts and open up our mouths and gather our children and grandchildren around us and put this word of God deeply into their heart. Write it upon their foreheads. Write it upon their hearts. And it doesn't matter whether they're poor or rich. It doesn't matter whether they're successful or they're cleaning a bathroom somewhere. They will find that you gave them a blessing. Amen. Because Amen. of David's heart, which was perfect unto the Lord. His grandson did not fail to sit on the throne of Judah because David passed down a generational blessing. Amen. Oh God. Somebody just asked the Lord, help me to pass generational blessings. Help me, help me to pass generational blessings. Oh, hallelujah. Help me, Jesus, so that my children know you, so that my grandchildren will serve you. Help me to that's the reason why I'm telling you, saints. We're going to have to move on from church hurt. We're going to have to deal with that demon right now. We're going to have to deal with the devil of church hurts and church wounds right now. Because sour grapes set the children's teeth on edge. We cannot hope, our children, hope for our children to serve the God that we love. If all we do is talk about how awful things are in his house. At some point we're going to have to clean up the house and then get our hearts clean. My God, lay the axe to the root of bitterness in our spirit. And then once again, rebuild a house of God that our children can find salvation in. That our grandchildren can find salvation in. God. Amen. So David is here. And he's having to deal with a generational curse. He's having to deal with an enemy that if Saul would have defeated him, he would have never had to fight him. So I'm telling you, I, I, I know you say, Pastor, you're being redundant here. I am being redundant here. Because redundancy is a wonderful teacher. Mm -hmm. If Saul had defeated the Amalekites in the measure that God had required him to, David would have never had to fight this battle. Amen. And it is the same way in our lives. If we will just find the courage and the grace of God necessary, to face, I mean full face, the enemies of our life and bring an end to the warfare in our hearts. Our children will not have to stand to fight those battles. We will have defeated the enemy for them. How many of y'all want to defeat the enemy for your children? Amen. Your grandchildren, I want to, I want to defeat the enemy. Amen. Amen. And I'm not talking about the enemy outside of me. I'm talking about the enemy in me. Right. God, help me to help me to defeat this guy. Right. Because I don't want my grandchildren being raised up around a bitter grandfather. I've got I've got I've got I've got uh, uh, two grandsons right now, and I've got a granddaughter, and I've got one more granddaughter on the way. I don't want I want them to be around someone who has love in their heart yes. and joy in their spirit. To where when they get around Poppy, they, they, they feel the love of God and they feel the joy of the Lord. Amen. I don't want them to get around a bitter heart and a bitter spirit. I don't want them to get around a paranoid person. Right. I want them to get around somebody who has full faith in God and full confidence in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And full assurance in the word of God that everything God said he would do, he will do. I want to pass to them a generational blessing. I want to build a church and churches. That they will be able to find salvation in. That they will be able to find safety in. That they will be able to find redemption in. That they will be able to find deliverance in. Amen. I want them to, I want to, I want to see, I want God to help me to produce people that will worship and praise God. Amen. So that there will be houses that my children and my grandchildren can find 
God's presence in. Amen. It's my heart, saints. It's my heart. I want to leave them something that they can survive on. I want to leave them something that will cause them to love God and call upon the name of the Lord. So, Lord, help us to defeat the enemy in me. If I'm holding on to past bitternesses, I've been around people like that. You ever been around somebody that the moment you walk into their presence, you get angry? The hostility, the spirit is so bad that you walk into their presence and all of a sudden you're on the defense and you don't even know them. You're protecting yourself and you have no clue who they are because the anger and the bitterness and the hostility is so radiating from them that the spirit inside of you says, protect yourself. I don't want, I don't want my children to be around a man like that. I don't want my grandchildren to be around a man like that. I want the love of God to radiate from me so profoundly that my grandchildren love to be around Poppy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That if I live to see great grandchildren, that they will love to be around their Poppy because they feel the presence and the joy and the love of God. Let that be in us, saints of God. So if there be in any of us a bit of bitter root, let's lay the axe to the root right now. Let's lay the axe to the root right now and say, Lord, I know that things in my past have been hard and difficult, and I know that I have had to face many crises and many circumstances, but I am alive. Amen. Sometimes you need to remind yourself you survived. Amen. Sometimes we get so caught up in the war, we forget we survived. Right, <laughs> right, amen. I, I, I have uncles that fought in Vietnam, and, and, and one of my uncles in particular, I've never talked to another uncle about it, but they won't talk much about it. But one of my uncles, he had flashbacks. And he would wake up in the middle of the night in terror and anger. And it, it, it overwhelmed him so badly that, that, that even to this day, he's got anger and harshness in him. And the older he gets, the more that's spilling out of him. But I, I just pray for him that maybe one day he'll realize he survived. I pray that one day he'll realize that he lived. That God gave him grace to make it through. And now he himself has children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Sometimes, saints of God, you've just got to be grateful you survived. You can't always look back at the warfare. You see, you, you must understand, you could, you could be now out of the actual conflict but still be in the war. Right. The fight could have ended, but you're still in the battle. Sometimes you just got to get on the other side of it and say, Lord, thank you I lived. Thank you I survived. Thank you I came through, Lord. Because what I cannot afford to do is let that bitter root get down on the inside of me because the Bible said, beware lest than any man. There spring up in him a root of bitterness and thereby many, many be defiled. Because when you have a bitter root in your spirit, when you have a bitter heart in your, in, in, in your life, everybody around you has got to deal with that poison. So let's defeat the enemy in me so that my grandchildren will find Jesus in me. Because it is Christ in me that is the hope of glory. And I am a living epistle written, written of God and read of man. When my grandchildren and my children and anyone that God will allow to cross my path comes into my way, I want to be somebody that radiates the love of God. I want to be somebody that the name of Jesus is apparently upon. God help us. So David is fighting this battle. But Saul refused to fight. He comes back and all, everything's gone. Everything's gone. David's dealing with one situation. And while he's dealing with that, the enemy sneaks in and takes everything away from us. Sometimes that can happen in your life. You ever have the enemy just sneak in and take everything? You aren't ready for it. You aren't planning on it. You had no warning it was coming. And the enemy just creeped in. Everything that you had acquired, everything that you had built, everything that you had loved, the enemy just sneaks in and snatches it away from you in a moment. And you're standing there bewildered, be, 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 bewildered and dismayed. Disillusioned. How could this have happened? How could the enemy have come in? I, I, Lord, I, I was just out taking care of business. I've seen many pastors lose their families. 
of a ministry. Because while they were out doing the will of God, they weren't being watchful. They weren't being mindful that there might be enemies that have their eyes set upon their family. And while they were out doing the will of God, when they came back, they had lost everything. And sometimes the enemy, you must remember, the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Right. That's the reason why the Bible says that we are to be watchful, we are to be mindful, that we're to be sober and vigilant, for we have an adversary, the devil, that goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. We have got to be aware that the enemy is constantly looking for a way into our lives. He's constantly looking for a way to take what God has given to you, because he's a thief, he's a liar. And there's sometimes you need to quit believing the liar. And you need to know that if God is for you, the devil cannot successfully stand against you. But we also have to be mindful and watchful. We cannot just be sloppy and reckless. We've got to be mindful and watchful, not paranoid and fearful, but just be sober and be vigilant because the devil is going to look for any way he can. What has happened in this church this weekend, the devil's going to look for every way to take it from you. Somebody, I'm telling you, there are people that are assignments of the enemy. They're assignments of the enemy. And where you've got joy in your heart right now and hope is beginning to spring back up in you, somebody is going to come to you after, after I'm gone. Somebody's going to come to you and start running their mouth and start tearing down what God is trying to do in this place. You just look at them like, you look at them like Jesus looked at Peter and you say, get behind me, Satan. Thou sayest not the things that be of God, but of man. I know what God is about to do. So hang the phone up. Walk away. Don't even pay attention to their words because they're cursing you. But they can't curse what God has blessed. You can't stop what God gets started. There's nobody that is greater than the Lord. Amen. 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 So be vigilant. Folks know this has gone on this week. I mean, for people I didn't even know existed. Folks know this is going on this weekend. And the first thing they're going to do is start hitting the phone line. And they're going to touch their communication channels wherever they have them. And they're going to start siphoning information. And when that comes to a place of trying to tear down, you just rebuke it in the name of Jesus and you go on. Because I'm telling you, God is not done with this church. In fact, we are now at a new beginning. God has restarted something at the Fellowship of Praise that I think is going to resound generations from now should the Lord tarry his coming. And we just need to hold on. There's a lot of work ahead, saints. You've got, you got a lot ahead of you. There's a lot to deal with. There's a lot to walk through. And I don't, don't lose hope when we leave here and you don't see everything like it was when we were here. Just keep on working. Keep yes. on plowing. God has got something Amen. for this place. Amen. And you just need to hold on. If God's bringing you in here, come in here and help. It might be awkward at the onset, but despise not the time of small things, because little is much when God is in it. Amen, amen, amen. And so, so David comes back and everything's gone. And he had to have a different mindset than the doubters. He had to, because when all of them came, they were all grieved. David went just like they went. They were all grieved. Every one of them were. But see, when you have a relationship with the Lord, that weeping only lasts for a moment. That that that, that weeping only lasts for a moment. I, leaders can't weep forever. If David would have fallen into the same grief that the others fell into. They would have all just laid down and died. But when, 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 when you're a leader, you can't grieve like everybody else grieves. You weep for a moment and then you start looking for the way. 
You weep for a moment and then you start looking to the Lord and saying, all right, Lord, now what do we do? Yes, this was hard, but what do we do now? And I'm not talking about just in the church. I'm talking about in your family. If you are a man of God in your family, which means you are the priest of your home. If that is you, you're the head of the house, you're the leader. That doesn't make you anything. Amen. I, I, I heard a story one time. A man was going around and every day, multiple times a day, he would tell his wife, I am the man of this house and I wear the pants in this family and don't you ever forget about it. Over and over again, day by day, over and over again, day by day, she had to hear this from him. Finally, she had had all she could take. And she took a baseball bat and knocked him right out. Drug him to the bed, took his pants off, put him on the bedpost, and laid him in the bed. When he woke up bewildered, bewildered, realizing what had just happened to him, he looked at her and he saw the pants on the bedpost and he said, Dear, would you hand me our pants? <laughs> Now, sisters, don't you be getting no baseball bats. I'm not giving you permission. I say that to say that God didn't give me to be the head of my house, to be a tyrannical leader. I'm actually to be a protector and a provider. Amen. That's really what headship is. It's, it's not a position, it's a responsibility. I wish more pastors would get that revelation. Headship is not a position, it's a responsibility. Pastor is not a position, it's a responsibility. Bishop is not a position, it's a responsibility. When it becomes a title, then it is egotistical. But when it becomes a responsibility in, hum in humility, we serve one another. I have preachers that tell me all the time, why are you so intermingling with the people? Aren't you afraid that that will bring familiarity? I said, shepherds smell like sheep. Amen. If you don't want to be amongst the people, you're not a shepherd. Right. So go do something else. Flip hamburgers, McDonald's. I just saw a sign. McDonald's says $14 an hour. <laughs> Hiring immediately. Day nine chips. If, if, if you don't want to be amongst the people, if you don't want to smell like sheep, then you have no call to be a shepherd. Right. Glory to God. But leadership also comes with responsibility. It is a responsibility. And David has a responsibility, a crisis has befallen him, and has befallen, befallen his followers. And they are absolutely distraught. They have lost everything, and they have no hope for it to return. But David goes off to himself, and the Bible said he encourages himself in the Lord. And when he goes to the Lord, he asks him some specific questions. Shall I pursue? Should we go after them? And the Lord said, yes, go after them. He says, Lord, shall I overtake them? Because David said, Lord, I don't want to go after them if we can't defeat them. And the Lord said, you will overtake them. He said, and without fail, you will recover I believe that we are coming into a season as God's people where we, where we will recover all. Glory. We will recover all. Amen. It doesn't Amen. matter what the enemy has stolen, we will recover all. Amen. If the enemy has taken out our spouses, we will recover all. If he has taken our children, we will recover all. Oh, what he has robbed from our churches, we will recover all. But we can't sit down and grieve forever. Right. Remember that weeping endures for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And I believe that God brought this boy from East Tennessee to St. Louis, Missouri to tell fellowship of praise it is morning. It is time for you to stop weeping. Amen. The morning has come. Amen. Now it's time for you to be full of joy and expectation and anticipation that what the devil meant for evil, God is going to turn it around and make it good. And this test is going to turn to your testimony. And without fail, we will recover all. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Depending on who you talk to, people are trying to 
say that the church, the heartbeat of the church is flatlining. I refuse to believe that. Amen. Amen. But the Bible says the last day, said God, yes. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Yes. Hallelujah. God. And, and somebody said, well, yeah, it'll be the young people. Oh, you saints of God that have been faithful down through the years. He's not counted you out either. He said, your old men shall drink dreams. I'm telling you, you older brothers better start dreaming again. God's going to let you have dreams again. You're going to look at the work of God and dream again. Hallelujah. You're not going to sit and just wait to expire. But there's going to be dreams back in your heart. Hallelujah. And those old men who dream dreams. They'll be right along with young men who can see visions. It is not over for the church of Jesus Christ. We have went through a little bit of a valley here. But I'm telling you, we're coming to the mountain. And it is time to get your boots on. Yes. It is time for you to get prepared. Up the mountain we go. We're about to see the greatest days of the work of God. Yes. So no more weeping. No more weeping. Be hopeful again. Be joyful again. Yes. We don't have to wait to die. We can live. Amen. Look at somebody near you if you would. Just help me preach to them and say, you shall not die. You shall not die. But you shall live. But you shall live. And declare the works of the Lord. And declare the works You will not die. Hallelujah. This is not unto death. You will not die, but you will live. And I don't care how much the enemy has stolen from you. I don't care how much the enemy has taken from you. God brought me here this morning. I'm telling you, I had a whole number of other messages prepared. But the Lord dealt with me right before I stood up and said, tell them without fail. They shall recover all. I don't know what you've lost in your life. I don't know what the enemy has stolen from you. But without fail, you will recover all. Hallelujah. You're going to get your joy back. You're going to get your hope back. You're going to get your children back in the house of God. Your grandchildren will call upon the name of the Lord. God told me to tell you without fail, St. Louis, it's time to recover it all. Hallelujah. For the Lord and begin to thank Him for saving your children. Thank Him for saving your grandchildren. Yes. Thank Him for absolutely bringing life back into this sanctuary because the greatest days of this place are yet ahead of us and it is time for us to stop looking to the past and weeping over what could have been and it is time for us to start reaching to the future of what will be. Paul said this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I reach toward those things which are before. I press it toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. The days of looking backward are Encourage yourself in the Lord. You have been brought into the kingdom of such a time as this. And without them, yes. you will recover. Amen. 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 I listen to churches and I hear them giving up. So many churches are going to. Well, this generation will never. This generation will never. Well, the best days are behind us. Just glad I can be a part of it. Now we'll just sit here and wait until Jesus comes. That's not what the Lord told me. He said, you occupy till I come. Right. Right. We wait till Jesus comes. No, 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 no. That's not what that word occupy means in the Greek. It is the same thing as us going into Iraq and throwing down an evil regime and occupying and taking that country. How do you feel about that? I have my feelings, but we won't go into the political dissertation of it today. But the point being is, occupy does not mean that we just sit and wait. It means we take territory till he comes. Mm -hmm. We take territory till he comes. And again, I know that many of you saints in here may feel like you're a past your prime, that you're older in years now, you don't have the strength to do it, but if God could take the dead body of a hundred-year-old man by the name of Abraham and wake him up. Amen. If God can take the womb, the dead womb 
of a 90-year-old woman by the name of Sarah and wake up the womb until not only did she produce Isaac, hallelujah, but she produced uh, but she produced many children afterward because God woke up the womb. I'm telling you, I don't care how old you are, don't you let the devil tell you that your productive days are over. God can wake you up. To serve the living God. Hope again, children of God. We're about to see something great here. We're about to see something great in Kingsport. And I'm just thankful that God has given me the opportunity to be a part of it. But I'm telling you now, we're going to recover it all. We're going to recover it all. Hallelujah. Like I told you the other night, there was at one point that they took Saul of Tarsus, which we call Paul, and they took him out and they stoned him outside of the city and they left him for dead. It would have been wise just to stay there long enough until his pulse had expired. But they left him because they thought that he, they had done the job well enough that there's no way he could get up from this. And I'm telling you, the enemy has done the same to many of God's people and to many of God's churches. He has beaten and battered and bloodied them. And he left and said, you know what? I've done the job now. There's no way for them to recover from this. But the devil should have stayed around long enough to check your pulse. Because there's more hope for a live dog than a dead lion. He should have waited till you died before he left you alone. Yes. Because now we're going to recover. Right. And we're going to recover it all. We're going to get back up again. And we're going to get about the Father's business. And God is going to be glorified Amen. in all that we do. Amen. Praise God. Glory. Praise God. Shall we pursue? Yes. Shall we overtake? Yes. And without fail, we shall.
But would you just grab the person's hand next to you if you would? And I just want us to pray together, pray over each other. If you got nobody beside you, go find somebody. Because without fail, without fail, we shall recover all. <laughs> I feel the Lord in this place. Without fail, we shall recover all. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for this weekend. I thank you for hope. I thank you for expectation. I thank you for anticipation. I thank you for being the God of all flesh, and I thank you for being my strength and my redeemer. I thank you for your word that is so quick and powerful, God. But I pray for my dear brothers and my sisters here all over this house, God. You're doing something, Lord. It's going to take some time. We've got a lot of work to do, God, both here and at home. But, Lord, you're, about, you're up to something. You're about to do something special, Lord God, in the midst of your people everywhere. God, help us to be a part of it. And I pray for my brother and my sister this morning, God, that if there's any enemy in me, that you would shine a great light upon it, Lord, that none of us would ever be a hindrance, God, to what you're going to do, Lord God, here in the very near future. Help us, oh God, to be stable. Help us, Lord God, to be hopeful. Help us, Lord, to be joyful. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus over that hand, Lord God, over that brother, over that sister, God, that if there's any in here that have been bruised and broken hearted, God, that you would bind up the broken hearted and you would set up the many of them that are bruised, oh God. Let us be, let us be generational blessings, God. Let us be generational blessings. That our grandchildren and our children will rise up and look at us and remember us and call us blessed. Because we gave them the name of the Lord. And we gave them the gospel of their salvation. Father, I thank you, God, for keeping us. And I thank you for healing us. I thank you, Lord God, that no matter what the devil has stolen from us, God, we will not surrender to fear. We will not cower to failure. But, Lord, we will rise up. We will pursue. We will overtake. And without fail, we will recover all. God, I find every spirit, God. I find every demonic power that would come against, Lord God, what you're doing, God. Lord, I find it in the name of Jesus. And I say like Michael, the archangel, said unto Satan, Satan, the Lord, rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I ask you that you would shut every mouth, God. Shut the mouth of every critic, every gainsayer, everyone who would slander. Cut off the lines of communication to those, God, who would try to, Lord, discourage God in the name of Jesus, God. And Lord, I pray from this moment moving forward that whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, let that be what's on our mind. And let that be what's coming out of our mouth. Let us stop speaking curses to one another. Let us stop speaking defeat to one another. And let us encourage each other in the Lord. Because the better days, the greater days, are yet ahead of us, oh God. Oh, Jesus. Help us, Lord God. Lord, we beseech you, Lord, out of your hill to hear us this morning. Answer, answer us by your word. In the mighty 